Hello, I'm Arizu Gaming, and today I want to talk about Geotuners, a building that was recently added in Oxygen Not Included that allows you to increase both the output volume and the output temperature of all of the different geysers in the game. Now this is a building where at first glance you may not know when it's actually worth geotuning a certain geyser. All of the different geysers in the game produce different materials. The resources that are needed to actually geotune these geysers vary significantly as well. And it can be a bit of an intimidating choice to make in the game. Like, do you use this building? Do you just ignore it and handle your geysers the old fashioned way? Or do you want to get the extra output out using this building? So this video and this tier list is more or less my opinions on which geysers I think are worth geotuning, either in the early game or the late game, and which you're safe to just ignore and get on with the usual way. So first of all, let's talk a bit more about the geotuner as a building. So it's a station that your duplicate needs to do a research errand on. They need to have the field research skill to actually use this. So you'll need at least two skill points for your duplicate. The building needs to be placed inside a laboratory. It doesn't need to be next to the geyser overall. It just needs to be on the same asteroid as the geyser you want to look at. But it does need to be in a laboratory. So you need two research buildings and a light source in the room. I would suggest just having a room where it's two geotuners and a lamp in the middle with some automation, and that will be a perfectly fine laboratory. So the building does require duplicate operation. You're probably going to want to deliver the resources that are required to geotune your specific geyser by automation. Just have a conveyor receptacle in there and an auto sweeper that will load in the resource that you want to use for geotuning, and then your duplicate isn't having to go back and forth constantly. The building does use 120 watts while the duplicate is doing the research errand, and it does generate 4.5 kD to use of heat while active, but the duplicate isn't going to be using the building all the time. Essentially what they'll do is they'll take the input material, say um, abyssalite, bleach stone, polluted dirt, refined phosphorus, or salt. They'll put that in the machine, then they'll do a data analysis errand with a yellow bar, and when that's done, you'll have a certain amount of times, you'll still have a certain amount of data available to do the geotuning with. And as the geyser erupts, that data will be used at a constant rate, and that will increase the output and the output temperature of the geyser, so long as you have data. So there's a very helpful table on the wiki where it explains which geyser requires which resource, what the resource cost is, when, both when the geyser is actually active and the average resource cost factoring in the behavior of the geyser itself. And we'll talk more about this later, but that's very important because that's, yeah, that's going to be telling you how resource efficient it is to geotune certain geysers. And this table also talks about how much the material output of the vent will increase by, both while the vent is active and its average output factoring on all the act active, active periods, dormant periods, etc. As well as the amount, the temperature output of the geyser will increase by. So this table on the wiki has all this very useful information in it. So well worth a look. Um, and you can also automate these as well. So uh, it can send a green signal when a geyser is erupting. And it can send a red signal when the geyser is not erupting. So you can time devices exactly based on whether a geyser is erupting or not using the geotuner building. And the last thing about geotuners is you can run up to five on a single geyser. You can't have unlimited geotuners geotuning a geyser so that you've got your, your metal volcanoes producing gaseous metals, etc. They patched that out of the game a while ago. So you can use anywhere between one to five geotuners on a single geyser. And as I talk about these geysers, I'm going to be talking about like the ideal amount of geotuners you're going to want to run on them, and whether there's any particularly good or particularly bad numbers of geotuners to run on the geysers. So without further ado, let's begin the actual tier list. So the first one I've got on my tier list is the saltwater geyser. And this is perhaps one of the best geysers to geotune in the game, and perhaps the justification for using this machine in the first place. But this is S tier. Now why is that? Well, the saltwater geyser normally erupts about 3 kilograms per second average of salt water, which is 7% salt, 93% water, at 95 degrees C. 
and each geotuner will add 20 degrees C to the temperature of the output material. So if you have one geotuner on the saltwater geyser, that will result in 1.2 times the amount of saltwater as 115 degrees C steam and salt just coming straight out the geyser. Now, that's not super useful, but if you have two geotuners on it, you've now got 1.4 times the amount of salt water, and it's coming out as 135 degrees C steam. And you can run that through a steam turbine super easily, A for power and B to get the water back to 95 degrees C. So by using the two geotuners, you're getting the salt out for free, so you can immediately use that for whatever you want to use it for, whether you want to use it for table salt, whether you want to actually use it in a bleach stone hopper to make more bleach stone. Um, and bleach stone is actually the material which is used to geotune the saltwater geyser in the first place. Now, you'll, the geotuner will use 83.3 grams per second of bleach stone while the saltwater geyser is erupting. But based on its average eruption behavior, you can expect this to use 25 grams per second um, over time of bleach stone and that will over time give you an extra 0.3 no that'll give you an extra 0.6 kilograms per second of salt water over time so there's some interesting maths behind this because the salt water is seven percent salt effectively seven percent of this is being turned into salt which you can then turn into bleach stone so your 25 grams per second of bleach stone is turning into 42 grams of salt per second. And if you're using this in a bleach stone hopper, that converts 30 grams of salt into 10 kilograms of bleach stone and 20 kilograms of sand. So this results in 14 grams per second of bleach stone per second coming out of this, which is about 56% of the required input material. So this so, so geotuning this saltwater geyser will actually give you more of the material that you need to geotune it in the first place. Um, over half of the amount of resources you need, which is really good. And you can use up to five geotuners on this as well, and you can get it going to 195 degrees C. And steam turbines will generate their maximum power with 200 degrees st um, steam. So you can actually get those steam turbines to almost max power by max geotuning the saltwater geyser. Now it should be said, because the geotuners run based on duplicates regularly doing the research errands to produce the data, you're not always going to have continuous uptime on your geotuners. It depends what the duplicates are up to and what other tasks they've got. So generally, I wouldn't make any builds that rely on five geotuners being active at once. But if you have five geotuners and at least two of them are going to be active at any one time, you're going to be getting your, your usable steam out of your saltwater geyser. And it's all going to be good. <laughs> so yeah, I would absolutely recommend geotuning these. I would prioritize that as soon as you can um, with whatever bleach stone that you've got on the map. And then you can actually just recycle some of that bleach stone. It'll make it a lot easier to get started. Um, and then you can just use your bleach stone hopper to get the rest of the bleach stone you need based on uh, salt from the map and from other sources. So next on the list, I'm going to talk about the cool steam vent. So this is something that I'm going to put in A tier. Uh, this produces this produces two kilograms per second. No, this produces one kilo one point five kilograms per second of 110 degrees steam on average. So one thing you'll notice about 110 degrees steam is it's not very convenient for steam turbines. Steam turbine steam needs to be at least 125 degrees C for the steam turbine to run. And if you're not running it through a steam turbine and you just want to pump out the water, you're going to have to cool down the cool steam by another 15 degrees or another 10 degrees C, around 15 degrees C. So cool steam vents are in that sort of region where it's kind of hard to utilize the steam properly. But geotuning is a really good solution for this. Because, again, all it takes is an average of 25 grams per second of bleach stone, and that will add 20 degrees C to the output steam. One geotuner will take this to 130 degrees C, at which point you can just run it through a steam turbine without any issues. And if you, you can, again, you can go up to four, and that's going to get you to 190 degrees 
steam. And that's going to be used in the steam turbines. If you use 5, you'll get it to 210 degrees, and you can still use it through the steam turbines, but some of the heat will be wasted. Um, because the steam turbine will only generate power based on the heat up to 200 degrees C. But essentially, if you run multiple geotuners on this, and at least one is running at all times, you can have this in a steam turbine room and not worry about it. It's quite reliable. When I built uh, industrial saunas on my steam, on my uh, stream, that actually... They actually have the cool steam vent in them, and I geotune that cool steam vent, and that and that comes out at 130 C with all of the other industrial devices heating up the steam as well, and I found that works pretty well. So geotuning is a a good way of making this geyser a bit more useful in the early game. There are ways of taming them without using power that are quite complicated to build, but I think geotuning them is a is a pretty good solution. You do just have to find a source of that bleach stone somewhere, but you can get that either from the bleach stone hopper or from using squeaky buff, uh, squeaky puffs to convert chlorine into bleach stone directly. And we'll talk more about that later as well. So next on the list, we have water geysers. And these produce three kilograms per second of water at 95 degrees C. So this is a geyser where it's kind of umming and ahhing. I think I might actually put this in B tier for geotuning, just because the water already comes out at exactly the right temperature for you to put into your electrolyzers and turn into 95 degrees oxygen and hydrogen without bothering with any geotuning. It's also a lot of water. It's enough water to oxygenate 25 duplicates with on average. So it's quite, unless you're using the, the water for something else, or you're using mass amounts of oxygen for something else, you don't often actually need, need to geotune a water geyser. If you find one, you've already got the solution to most of your duplicates' oxygen needs. That being said, if you do geotune it, it's essentially like the salt water geyser, except you're not getting the salt back out. So you do need to find a bit more bleach stone in general to do it, but you are going to get a lot of water. You're going to get an extra 0.6 kilograms per second of water per geotuner out. And if you have at least two geotuners running, you can run it all through a steam turbine safely. I feel like putting it in B tier is a bit mean. I think I am gonna put it in A tier because it, it's still pretty it's still pretty good to geotune if you want the extra water or you want the extra steam, want to get some extra power out of it. It just it does give you a lot of water, and you only need ge two geotuners to really get the most out of that. But uh, you, you really don't need to geotune this, but if you do, you are getting a lot of bang for your buck. So it feels a little bit mean putting it in B tier, but I, it's kind of like on the cusp. So next on the list, we have the regular steam vent. So this I'm going to put in B tier. Uh, and the reason for that is the steam vent doesn't actually produce as much water as the other water sources. You're still using your 25 grams per second of bleach stone, but you're only getting 150 grams per second of steam extra steam out of that per geotuner and the steam from these steam vents comes out at 500 degrees c so the 20 degrees c increase isn't actually going to meaningfully increase the the heat that you're getting from it as much because the output volume is so low water still has a lot of heat capacity in general so this 20 degrees c is going somewhat far um, and if you are using a steam vent in your colony primarily for power Doubling the output with five geotuners and getting that up to 600 degrees is going to give you more power. But part of the problem with these steam vents is the temperature of the steam itself is so hot. A lot of, It's quite easy to waste a lot of that heat when you're trying to siphon it off with steam turbines. You either need to do some shenanigans where you're only using two of the output ports and you're limiting the amount of water coming in to actually get all of that power out, or you're having to cool it you're having to cool the steam on something else before you send it to your steam turbines to get all of that power on. Um, so it can be a little bit fiddly, but geotuning these can give you a decent amount of extra power, and it's it's a good way of turning the it's a good way of turning the bleach stone that you have into a way of getting extra power. But generally, I just think the extra water that you get from the other water sources is more impactful. And I think if you were thinking of geotuning a steam vent for power, there are better <laughs> there are better geysers that you can geotune for power that don't use a resource that's as annoying as bleach stone. 
So I'm going I'm to put the steam vent in B tier. It's not bad, but definitely prioritize other water sources over it first. Except for the next three. So there's three water sources that I generally wouldn't recommend geotuning unless you're in a real pickle and you desperately need more water. So the first of those is the polluted water vent. So this produces three kilograms per second of polluted water with germs at 30 degrees C. So there's two things to note about that. First of all, it's polluted water, so you might want to feed that to plants. Um, and plants don't like it too hot. <laughs> so you probably don't want to geotune it unless you're feeding it to unless you're feeding it to pincher peppers. In which case you can probably get away with it, but you're probably not going to want to feed pincher peppers like three or four kilograms per second of polluted water. That's a lot of pincher peppers. But maybe you do. Uh, but yeah, the second thing is um, actually getting the polluted water to the temperature where it turns to steam is going to require at least four geotuners. So if you're just doing this to boil the water and clean it, you really are just better off using the power that you'd take to run the geotuners and, and the resources and just running the polluted water through a water sieve instead. Um, yes, that does require some filtration medium, but you're not heating up the water by such a degree and then cooling it down again if you want to cool it down. If you do just want to electrolyze it, I can see someone I can see someone geotuning it just to electrolyze it as their only water source. But I feel I feel like it, it comes out so cold enough, you'd either rather feed it to plants, or you would rather heat it up on something else that needs cooling down, get the cooling from that cold water, and then sieve it and use it in an electrolyzer. So Generally, I don't think there's too many cases where you'd want to do this, unless it was your only water source and you desperately just needed more water. Um, and that's similar for the next two. So believe it or not, the, the primary benefit of the cool salt water geyser, or the cool salt slush geyser, is that it comes out cool. <laughs> it comes out at minus 10 degrees C, and it's brine. However, there is actually an argument to be made for geotuning this. And the argument is, the brine that actually comes out of this thing is 30% salt. Unlike the regular saltwater geyser where it's just 9% salt. So you're using 25... Oh wait, ads. You're using 25 grams per second of bleach stone. And you're getting effectively 90 grams per second of salt out of that cool salt slush geyser that you're geotuning. And if you run that in a bleach hopper, in a bleach stone hopper, you're going to turn that into 30 grams per second of bleach stone. So the cool salt slush geyser is actually a geyser that will pay for itself entirely by geotuning it. And there are more efficient ways to turn to uh, get the um, to get the bleach stone back as well if you have the salt, which I'll talk about later. So it's actually not bad. The, the water throughput of the geyser isn't amazing. If you geotune this with five geotuners, it's going to produce as much salt. It's going to produce as much water as a normal salt water geyser, and the brine is going to be at 90 degrees C. So it's more or less going to be like a max geotuned cool salt slush geyser is going to be more or less the same as a regular salt water geyser, except it's brine and you're getting a 30% salt. So. Considering it's actually free, I think I'll move this up to B tier. Most of the time you're going to want the cool water to actually just cool stuff down with. Like, use it to cool stuff down in your base and then feed the salt water either to a desalinator. So you can't feed the brine to water weeds. You can still desalinate it though. So I think there's a pretty good argument to be made for actually geotuning it just because it gives you more bleach stone back than it takes. And you get all the water out afterwards. You, you definitely can't turn it to steam even with five geotuners. Um, but I, I think it is worth considering. Because you can use it to actually multiply the amount of bleach stone you have. And I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, the regular cool slush geyser, I, yeah, this, this I don't think is really worth geotuning. I'm going to put this at C tier though. Because there may be circumstances where your only available water source is a cool salt, a, a regular cool slush geyser. That is polluted water that is coming out at minus 10 degrees C. And it's coming out at the 1.5 kilograms per second flow rate. So if you're desperate for water to feed your plants, 
you might consider geotuning that to get more water and to get it to a temperature where the plants are comfortable with it. You'd probably want to geotune this twice. And then that would get the polluted water that comes out of the cool slush geyser to 30 degrees C. And it would give you it would give you 40% more water. So it would give you 2.1 kilograms per second on average. So if you don't have any other water sources, it might be worth considering. But if you do, absolutely geotune those ahead of this. Because you'd much rather just have the cooling capacity available to cool stuff, other stuff down in your base. If it was just a temperature, I would never consider geotuning these because you would be better off just using it to cool stuff down your base and taking that waste heat and then feeding that waste heat to the plants. That's absolutely what you should be doing. But if you need 40% more water from this, then geotuning it is a thing you can do. But again, you're gonna have to find that bleach stone from somewhere because this isn't gonna refund any of that. So yeah, those are my thoughts on the different water geysers. So the next set of geysers that I'm gonna talk about are the metal volcanoes. And these are all interesting in that the resource they require for geotuning is refined phosphorus. So how do you make refined phosphorus? Well, we recently done that on Twitch and we're gonna release a YouTube video about that shortly. But essentially what you do is you take regular phosphorite either from the map or from Dreco's and you have to heat this up to about 246 degrees C, at which point it will melt into liquid phosphorus. And that liquid phosphorus must then be cooled down and recondensed back to about 40 degrees C, at which point it will turn into refined phosphorus. And there is no machine in the game that does this. You're going to have to figure out how to do this on your own, or with the help of a useful YouTube video or Twitch stream. <laughs> so, um, one thing to note, Regular phosphorite is infinitely renewable because it comes from Dreco's, eating plants. So you're never going to run out of phosphorite if you have enough Dreco's, so that's good. And it has a relatively low specific heat capacity, so it's somewhat easy to get to this temperature. And the thing to note is once it actually turns into liquid phosphorus, the heat capacity increases by a factor of 5, and it turns to 0.77. So you can actually have a tank of heated liquid phosphorus and you can use that to preheat the incoming phosphorite ore and that will actually have enough extra heat energy from the melting process to heat up the rest of the phosphorite. So once it gets started you don't actually need that much heat to go into it. And then you just need to cool it down. Um, because it's a liquid what I would recommend is just dropping it onto another liquid and getting that 625 times thermal conductivity boost. This liquid is not very conductive at all, so I would definitely recommend dropping it into another liquid. Make sure that liquid is cooled, probably with a thermo aqua tuner, and then that's going to get down to your that temperature pretty well. At which point it will be nice and room temperature and you can bring it into your base and your laboratories where you're doing your geotuning without too many issues. So now that you've actually got the refined phosphorus, you're using it to geotune the metal volcanoes. So the first volcano I'm going to talk about is the Gold Volcano. This is going in A tier. The Gold Volcano is arguably one of the best metal volcanoes in the game because it's the easiest to tame. Even though the gold comes out hotter than most of the other metals from the metal volcanoes, gold has such a low heat capacity that it's going to be very easy to cool down to the temperatures you want. One self-cooled steam turbine is generally enough to handle a Gold Volcano. Also, just pouring a big puddle of polluted water on it from your swampy biome or whatever is usually enough to handle it for hundreds of cycles. So if you want more gold, if you want more refined metal, geotuning a gold volcano is relatively easy. Um, it will require, the geotuner will require 133.3 grams per second of refined phosphorus while the volcano is active. And because metal volcanoes tend to be active for a relatively small amount of time between the, um, between their sort of inactive periods. This actually translates to only about 4.7 grams per second of phos uh, refined phosphorus being used on average over time, which is an extremely small amount. Your Drecos are gonna be producing this pretty easily even if you have only one ranch, and there's also plenty of phosphorite on the map for you to boil and condense. So once you've actually managed to make it, it's not really a constraint on any of these, it's very resource efficient and Factoring into account the average 
eruption behavior of the gold volcano, that 4.7 grams per second of refined phosphorus is going to give you 60 grams per second of gold. So that's a really good deal. You're getting like 12 times the resources bank from what you put in. Now, all of these methyl volcanoes are going to increase in temperature by 50 degrees C. But again, because gold has such a low heat capacity, this doesn't actually increase the heat of the gold that much. If you run five geotuners on a gold volcano, you're going to get twice as much gold, and it's only going to be 250 degrees hotter. You can easily handle all of that extra heat and extra methyl with just two self-cooled steam turbines which is more or less the amount of self-cooled steam turbines you'd use to handle a normal metal volcano that's not geotuned. So absolutely worth geotuning these because it's relatively easy, you don't need that much cooling, and you're just getting all of that metal. Very worth doing. Now, on the other hand of the scale, on the other side of the scale, there's also the aluminium volcano. So this I'm also putting in AT for the exact opposite reason. Aluminium has a really high heat capacity. So it will give you a lot of power as you're cooling it off. If you've set up a volcano tamer using steam turbines, you're going to need about four self-cooled steam turbines. But I'd, I'd honestly recommend a lot of the time just using actively cooled steam turbines with a thermo aqua tuner in the room. Um, but it generates a lot of heat and can give you a lot of power. And aluminium is also the mo one of the most conductive metals in the game. Its, it's thermal conductivity is way higher than steel, cobalt, anything else you might be making. So if you want to make something out of refined metal that's conductive, you're going to want aluminium. So taming these is important and getting more aluminium is important because it'll let you build those highly conductive structures, whatever else you're doing, better than other, other metals. So if you geotune these, the aluminium is going to come out at, say, let's actually have a look. So the gold volcano the metal comes out at around 2,626 degrees. That's going to increase to 2,870 degrees, which isn't a huge relative increase in the heat. And also the heat capacity of the gold is less. The aluminium volcano is going to increase in heat from 17, um, 1,726 degrees to about 1,976 degrees C. Relatively, that's a higher increase in the amount of heat energy available and the heat capacity of the aluminium is more. So you could run many, many actively cooled steam turbines off of a single max geotuned aluminium volcano. And that's going to be a huge amount of power. I haven't actually done the, amount, the exact maths on whether you'd go power positive running it actively cooled, but it's a lot of power to work with and it's definitely worth considering if you, if you have one. A, because you want more of this excellent metal to use, and B, because the power is there for you to run your colony off of. It's really good. Um, and these are both the two extremes of the heat scale. You want to geotune your gold volcanoes if, you, if you're more focused on the metal volume than the heat. And you want to focus on the aluminium volcano if you're more focused on the actual heat that you're getting from it and the, and the conductivity of the metal. So next on the list is the Iron Volcano. <laughs> and this is also going in A tier um, for a slightly different reason. You need iron to make steel. You're, if, you're, if you're wanting to make a lot of steel for heat resistant applications or just for building stuff in general, because a lot of buildings that require metal ore can also be built with steel. And metal ore isn't easily refinable. Once you run out on your initial asteroids, you have to go into space to mine more. You have to collect more of it from meteors and stuff. It's it's not pleasant trying to get more metal ore. Like on our current Twitch one, we're just running loads of rusty oxidizers just to get more iron ore to actually build stuff out of. So having a huge stockpile of steel that you can use to build stuff out of instead is pretty good. And you're always guaranteed to find iron volcanoes on the, the frozen tundra asteroid, uh, the outer asteroid. You're always going to find a couple of them. So I would highly recommend geotuning those just so that you have more iron available to make steel with and then run a massive amount of steel in the late game. Very important. And in terms of thermal properties, it's between gold and aluminium. Um, so you'll get a decent amount of power from steam turbines cooling it down. And yeah, iron's not a bad metal anyways. So that goes up there. Tungsten, you're going to find this later on in the game. 
Uh, you're only going to find this on the specific outer asteroid with the tungsten in it. But again, it's a very heat resistant material. Uh, it has a really high melting point, which is very useful in certain applications that you can't really get anywhere else easily. And you will find multiple tungsten volcanoes on that outer asteroid. So you're guaranteed to have a pretty good amount available. Geotuning that is going to give you a lot more of this heat resistant material. And I haven't gotten to this point in the game yet, but I'm imagining that it's pretty worth geotuning. You're not going to get a huge amount of extra heat from geotuning this because it comes out at such a high temperature and has a really low heat capacity as well. So you're mostly just going to get the extra metal out of this. You will need to double the amount of cooling you have just because you're doubling the amount of metal that is coming out of the volcanoes. Um, but it's only going to be a little bit more than doubling it because the heat capacity is so low and the relative temperature of the output is so low relative to the actual temperature of the tungsten. You can see it comes out of the volcano at 3726 degrees. So with five geotuners, that's going to go up to 3976 degrees. So relatively a small increase, especially compared to the aluminium volcano. So these are the metal volcanoes I put in A tier. They all have the same behavior with regards to the amount of refined phosphorus they need, the amount of output material they give you. Now, unfortunately, the copper volcano and the cobalt volcano I'm putting in B tier, not because they're bad. I would put them at the top of B tier, but just because if you have the other metal volcanoes, they have properties that make them worth getting more of. The opportunity cost of geotuning a gold volcano or a cobalt, um, a copper volcano or a cobalt volcano is relatively high just because these aren't as useful. Um, the copper volcano does give you decor, but the gold, um, the gold metal from the gold volcano also gives you the same amount of decor. And um, there's less heat energy if you're worried about that. And the cobalt volcano doesn't really, uh, the cobalt from the cobalt volcano doesn't really have any particularly useful qualities. It is quite conductive. Apart from aluminium, it's, it's the most conductive metal that you'll have early access to. If you have an aluminium volcano, you're probably going to want to geotune that first, just because of the extra just because the material is more conductive and if you're doing that for power you're going to get more power now if you don't care about the power at all then you may want to geotune a cobalt volcano over an aluminium volcano but it's less than half as conductive as the aluminium volcano there's a big difference in conductivity so i think it, i think i would still put it in b tier but they're not really that much worse than the rest of these metal volcanoes so the last metal volcano that we have on the list is the Niobium volcano. And I haven't quite reached this point in the game yet on uh, streams or outside of streams, but I don't think I have to have gotten to that point in the game to tell you that the Niobium volcano is an S tier candidate for geotuning. And this is for two reasons. First of all, Niobium as a metal uh, has a very interesting property in that it gives you a massive overheat temperature boost as well as a decor boost. And you can turn it into thermium, which is an even better overheat temperature. So late game, this is the material that you're going to want to use to build stuff out of where it's in really high temperature environments. You absolutely don't want it to overheat. So this, this material is completely unique in that regard. You can only find it on the superconductive asteroid. So it's, it's challenging to get to, but offers a prize that no other, no other refined metal does. So you're obviously going to want to double the amount of niobium that you have by geotuning it. And the second reason why this is easily the best metal volcano to geotune is because of its behavior. Um, unlike the other metal volcanoes, the, the niobium volcano vomits out an extremely large amount of material over a very short amount of time. So the niobium volcano actually erupts at such a rate, it erupts at 53.3 kilograms per second on average, compared to the metal volcanoes which erupt around 1.7 kilograms per second on average while they're erupting. So the metal volcanoes erupt for much longer, even though it's still a relatively short interval. The Niobium volcano behaves more like a magma volcano where there's an absolutely huge eruption that's over in seconds and then you're waiting days for it. And because of how the geotuner works, it costs us, uh, the geotuner still uses the same amount of material while the volcano is erupting. But because the Niobium volcano erupts for so much less time, the amount of material used to geotune it is much less. It's actually only 0.6 grams per second of, of refined phosphorus. And again, because of the amount of material that's coming out, you actually get four times the amount of metal out of the volcano as well as you get in. So you're turning 
0.6 grams per second of refined phosphorus into 240 grams per second of ultra heat resistant material. So it's absolutely a no-brainer. If you have any Drekkers at all, or even just like a fairly decent amount of phosphorite on one of your asteroids, it's an absolute no-brainer to geotune the, the Niobium volcano and get twice the amount. It's not like the metal is going to turn into a weird gas or anything. Uh, the Niobium comes out of the Niobium volcano at 3,226 degrees normally. Uh, it turns into gas Niobium at 4,743 degrees. You're not reaching that temperature. So it's absolutely something that's worth geotuning. You're not going to have any unintended consequences geotuning it. If you get to the Niobium volcano, you should be geotuning it. In fact, this, this is probably the top of the list. This is probably like, if you don't geotune anything else, geotune this volcano. Um, and on a similar vein, we've got the next candidate. And this is the magma volcano. So now I'm going to talk about the geysers that actually use abyssalite as the material for the geotuning. So this is interesting for a few reasons. A, because you have immediate access to it on the map as soon as you have a duplicate with hard digging, because you'll find it separating the biomes and all the asteroids. Um, so that's interesting. But it's also interesting because it's technically a non-renewable resource. You can't find more abyssalite than what's already on your asteroids. There is no space point of interest that produces abyssalite. There is no geyser that produces abyssalite. So if you are doing a build like this, you need to make sure that it's a build where if you're planning on running for your base for thousands of cycles, you can't rely on abyssalite geotuning to run your base. So it's worth using the shorter term solutions to give you more of a resource that you need immediately. And then eventually you can transition away from using it for geotuning. To be fair, I think I think geotuning with abyssalite is a good use of the material. Um, there's, there's not too much else you can do with Abyssalite. You can technically melt it into tungsten, but you have tungsten volcanoes in the game. I think that's more of a an engineering flex than an actual practical application for this material. Um, you do use it for actually making insulation the material as well. You combine it with isoresin and reed fiber to make the insulation material, which is by far the most insulative material in the game. So you're probably not going to want to geotune all of your abyssalite. You're probably going to want to save some of it to make some insulation late game for some applications where you absolutely don't want any heat transferring. But I think the majority of the abyssalite on the map you can relatively safely use for geotuning. So with that being said, let's actually have a look at the different guys you can geotune with abyssalite. So the Volcano and the Minor Volcano immediately stand out as good candidates because even though the Geotuner requires 166.7 grams per second of Abyssalite to run while the Geyser is active, the Magma Volcano and the Minor Volcano behave similarly to the Niobium Volcano in that they erupt a massive amount of material all at once and then they go dormant for days. And again, that results in the actual average resource cost of the geotuner to be way less than it normally would be. In this case, only 0.75 grams of abyssalite per second, which is a, a minute amount. You will have hundreds of tons of abyssalite on your starting asteroid if it's a classic asteroid. And every other asteroid you go to will have a decent amount as well. You're practically never going to run out of abyssalite if you're using it just for geotuning these magma volcanoes. And the, result, the resultant average output is an extra 110 grams per second per geotuner for a minor volcano and double that 220 grams per second for a regular volcano. And the material is going to increase in heat by a staggering 150 degrees C. So why is this all relevant? Why are you geotuning a volcano? A, if you're ranching a lot of hatches, eventually they're going to eat all of the rock on the map. I know this because we did this on a Twitch stream. So eventually you're going to want more rock, and the only way you're going to get that, um, apart from mining in space, is taming volcanoes and getting the igneous rock out of them and feeding it to stone hatches. And if you geotune them, you can get twice as much rock, which means you can have twice as many hatches. Now, the merits of ranching massive amounts of hatches are somewhat debatable, but this is a use case for it. However, the main use case for the volcanoes is the massive amount of heat. The magma has a heat capacity of 1, and it comes out of the volcanoes at 1,726 degrees C. So you can, if you can actually condense the magma into igneous rock, 
and feed it through steam turbines. It can get a little complicated, but it's a very large amount of power that's actually available to you. And increasing the temperature of this magma by 150 degrees gives you more relative heat energy than increasing the output of a water geyser by 20 degrees. Even though water has a specific heat capacity of about 4.2 compared to Magnus 1, it's still more heat. So you're going to use a minuscule amount of abyssalite, which otherwise you can't use, to generate a very large amount of heat. And assuming you can build the infrastructure to handle that, that's going to give you a huge amount of free power. Um, which is, again, a very good actual use case for geotuning. Extra geothermal power. So, for that reason, I'm going to put the regular volcano in S tier. And I'm going to put the minor volcano... <laughs> I'm going to put the minor volcano in A tier. Only because it is literally just half the output of the regular volcano. So, if you have a regular volcano, you should always be geotuning this over a minor volcano. But some asteroids don't have regular volcanoes. Some only have miners. And that's still okay. It's still giving you a huge amount of return on your investment. And to be honest, it's probably a bit easier for you to manage, especially in the mid game when you're just when you're just getting your steam turbines and everything set up. The amount of sheer heat a regular magma volcano could produce is quite intimidating. So, I would I wouldn't blame you if you geotuned a, a minor volcano. <laughs> it was on your asteroid, but I would if it, I would if there was also a regular volcano there. <laughs> so that's why I'm putting it in A tier. But the, yeah, they both follow the same logic. It's the same material. It's just literally half as much. So next on the list, I want to talk about the sulfur geyser. So this is an interesting geyser in that it's technically a water source, but you geotune it with abyssalite instead of bleachstone. So bleachstone is renewable if you have salt and gold for the bleachstone hopper, or if you have chlorine and squeaky puffs. The abyssalite is not renewable at all. However, it's still pretty good being able to turn an essentially useless early game resource into more dirt and more water. And you do that by taking the sulfur, the liquid sulfur from these sulfur geysers, and feeding it to a sweetle. So what you do is you take the sulfur, you feed it to the sweetle, it turns 50% of that sulfur into sucrose. You then take that sucrose, feed it to the grub grub, and it will turn it will turn 100% of the sucrose into mud at 30 kilograms per cycle and then that mud you can separate out into dirt and water using a sludge press or you can put it in a hot room where it will boil out into 40% dirt 60% steam i would recommend doing this with a sludge press to see what room temperature water if you want to use that for cooling or plants if you don't want to use it for cooling or plants you can just put it in a steam room and boil it and get the dirt and steam out that way without requiring a duplicate interaction with the sludge press. But I've already made a video about sweetles and grub grubs and how you get that sulfur into dirt and water. Um, so let's go back to actually focusing on the geotuning. So when you geotune a sulfur geyser, you're effectively using 50 grams per second average abyssalite on uh, and getting 300 grams per second average of sulfur out of that. So pound for pound, it, it's not a bad uh, return rate. Obviously, it's not as good as the return rate on the magma volcanoes, but you're getting something fundamentally different out of it. You're getting more water for oxygen, hydrogen, and more dirt for whatever you want to use dirt for. So geotuning sulfur geysers is going to help you get those resources to your duplicates, especially in cases where you might not have access to those resources. If you're on a flipped asteroid and your main water source is a, a hot steam vent and the and the submerged sulfur geyser in the magma biome you're probably going to want to geotune one of those for water and you're going to get more water geotuning the sulfur geyser i mean they're different resources so you can geotune both but essentially that 300 grams per second of sulfur once it's cooled down and once it's fed to sweetles is going to turn into 180 grams per second of sucrose and then that's going to turn into 108 grams per second of water which you can then electrolyze and get your oxygen from um, it is somewhat complicated getting to that point 
Um, the heat of the sulfur geyser will increase by 15 degrees C. Sulfur doesn't have a huge heat capacity, but it can, it does, if you geotune a sulfur geyser to the max, it's going to go from 165 degrees to about 240 degrees. So it's going to require a fair bit of cooling. And we've done this recently on our Twitch stream. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is with max geotuned sulfur geysers, we're running it through a steam turbine room to get it back down to 125 degrees. And then we're dumping it in some liquid. There's probably some slightly better ways to do that, but you can you can get a decent amount of power through geotuning it um, as well. It's, it's not a huge amount, but you, you are going to need to cool it down before you feed it to the Sweetles. And it should be said, you do have to feed it to the Sweetles. There's no other way of turning the sulfur into anything. I mean, I guess you could technically use the sulfur for feeding those rub fruit plants, but again, it needs to be cooled down for you to do that without overheating the plants. Um, but... I think it's worth doing anyways, because Sweetles and Grub Grubs give you good uh, food. They, um, it gives you more dirt as well, and they can, and they can tend plants and give you extra food. So overall, I don't think it's a bad use case. So I'll, I put it in A tier. I, I think I would probably, I, I don't think I would put it above the cool steam vent. I think I would probably geotune that first, just to make it more usable with the steam turbines. It's a lot less effort than geotuning this and doing all the ranching. But ultimately, the end result is good. So I don't think I could just find not putting it in A tier. But yeah, let me know what you think. And then we've got these three geysers. <laughs> these three also require Abyss, um, Abyss Light to geotune. And I don't think very highly of these. Not at all. So the natural gas vent I'll talk about first. I'm going to put this in C tier. So, there's a few problems with this. So, one of the problems is you're using 50 grams per second of abyssalite, and you're only actually getting 21 grams per second average extra natural gas out of the gas geyser, which really isn't a lot. Now, if you run that straight through a natural gas generator, that's going to give you about 187 watts worth of power, of extra power for that abyssalite cost. Um, and for comparison, a minor volcano, like the worst magma volcano, you feed that 0.75 grams per second, and you're going to get about 250 watts of extra steam turbine power out of that. So if you're doing this just for power, late game, you're always going to want to use your abyss light to geotune volcanoes or minor volcanoes. There's no question in terms of resource efficiency. However, I'm not putting it in D tier, because geotuning a natural gas geyser early on is is pretty a pretty good way of getting power early on. If you have natural gas geyser, you've got enough power to run some things off very early on, just getting that set up immediately, um, just with early game stuff. And setting up a geotuner and running it off abyssalite early is also relatively straightforward. So if you want to run five geotuners on your natural gas geyser and double the amount of power you have access to early game so that you can get to late game faster. I don't think that's a bad decision. You're obviously not going to use all of your abyss light on this, but you're going to mine some abyss light early on anyways just to get to other biomes. So I wouldn't blame you for using the initial abyss light you mined to geotune a natural gas geyser, get the extra power going, and then go from there. Now one thing to factor is, Obviously, when the duplicate is actually using the geotuner, the geotuner is using 120 watts itself. But they're not going to be using it most of the time when it's actually running. They're just going to be using it to generate the data. So you're still going to get enough power out of it that it's probably worth doing. So that's why I'm putting it in C tier. Definitely don't do it once you have access to magma volcanoes. But if you want to do it, if you don't, if you really don't have any better power sources available in the early game, I can see you doing this and it and it helping you out. So actually, I think I'd probably put that at the top of C tier because it, it's it's not really competing with anything early on. It's competing with the minor volcano later on, but I, I, I think I would rather geotune this out of desperation than geotune these out of desperation, but I, I think that's quite subjective. Um, the natural gas will increase in temperature by 15 degrees. It comes out at 150 degrees anyways. So slightly too hot for gold amalgam. You're probably going to want either a little bit of passive cooling just from dumping water in the room occasionally. Or if you manage to get some steel early, using steel stuff to 
pump the natural gas, etc. But ultimately, the gas is deleted in the generator, so I don't typically worry about the heat too much. Even with five geotuners, it's only going up to 225 degrees, and the heat capacity of the gas is not as high as the heat capacity of water, and you're getting such a small amount of gas out of the geyser, it's very easy just to dump more water on it. So I don't, I don't think the temperature is really an issue. You can cool this max geotune without too many issues. And if you don't, you can still just build stuff out of steel and it'll be fine. So yeah, I think, I think I'm going to put that at the top of C tier. Now, next is the hydrogen vent. So this is, I think, strictly worse to geotune than the natural gas vent. But again, I think it's still permissible in an emergency. If you're if you're desperately trying to do super sustainable and you've just got a hydrogen vent and it's right there outside your base, you can geotune this and double the amount of hydrogen you've got for extra power. Um, the hydrogen generator actually uses 100 grams per second of hydrogen while the natural gas generator only uses 90 grams per second. And they both give you 800 watts. So you're getting less watts per unit of abyssalite out of the hydrogen vent, for starters. It's not as good. Um, also, you're not getting the polluted water out of your generators like you are from the natural gas vent. And in some cases, it's useful because you might not want the extra waste product. But in other cases, you're probably going to want to use that polluted water for something else. Um, I think generally, not getting the extra polluted water makes it worse. That's just my opinion. Um, so that's another knock against the hydrogen vent. But the other knock as well is you're only doing this early game. If you're doing this late game, just geotune a magma volcano instead. But if you're doing it early game, adding an extra 15 degrees C of heat to your hydrogen vent where it's coming out of 500 degrees C isn't really helpful. Um, either, you're, either you're cooling it down with water already and the extra heat isn't actually adding significantly to the temperature of the gas, or all your stuff's overheating anyways, and it's it's not good. And if you are hooking a steam turbine up to your hydrogen vent, you're not really getting that much extra power out of it. You are doubling the amount of gas, so you are doubling the amount of power, but the, the 15 degrees adding onto 500 is not that significant. It's like, I, I'm not sure it's really worth the hassle. Like, if you're setting up steam turbines for stuff anyways, which you are doing if you're properly taming a hydrogen vent, most likely, then if you're just setting up the steam turbines, you're probably just going to set them up in a volcano instead. And if you're not doing that and you're just dumping water on it, then geotuning it, you're just going to get... It's... I'm just not convinced. I, I, I mean, let me know what you think, but I think generally, early game, if you're doing this with your abyssalite, you'd always want to do the natural gas vent because it's just going to be easier to handle all the geotune gas and you're going to get slightly more power out of it. And you're not going to have to faff about with steam turbines yet because it's going to be cold enough that you can just use steel or just dump water on it. So that's my opinion on the hydrogen vent. And the next and final abyssalite guild geyser that we have is other done the leaky oil fisher. This is uh, this is the first D tier one. <laughs> this geotuning this is a trap. So let me explain why. First of all, the leaky oil fisher is more or less constantly active. Um, it has dormant periods, but it's about half. It's dormant about half the time the other geysers are dormant. So the average. Um, throughput of abyssalite going into this is 100 grams per second as opposed to 50 grams per second. So you're using twice as much of this completely finite and non-renewable material to do this. And what is the actual benefit? You're heating the oil up by 15 degrees and you're getting 25.1 grams per second extra oil. So you're turning a quarter of the abyssalite into oil, which is not really a good throughput. I mean, yes, the abyssalite isn't super useful, but there are way better uses for this when it comes to geotuning. Um, and second of all, the specifics of the geyser itself. So the oil is going to heat up by 15 degrees C. If we look at the geyser, the crude oil is coming out at 326.85 degrees. Now, you might think, if I max geotune this, I'm actually going to turn the leaky oil fissure into a petroleum geyser, and then I can use that petroleum to run stuff. Um, and you'd be wrong. <laughs> if, you, if you're just geotuning this, you're, with five geotuners, you're adding 75 C to the temperature, and that's getting you to 401.85 degrees C. 
<laughs> it actually the petroleum actually needs to get to 400 the crude oil needs to get to 402.85 degrees c to become petroleum so not only do you have to max geo to this you also have to add other heat from another source that is already hotter than 400 degrees c you can't just like run like um like a hot water geyser or whatever over it um it has to be something that's already blooming hot to actually get this just over the threshold. So the easiest thing I can think of to do early game when you're doing this, because you're never going to want to do this late game. You're only going to want to do this early game. Late game is way better sources of oil in general. Um, just, just geotune more water geysers, get more water for your oil wells, run those oil wells. Just do that. It's way more material efficient. Way higher throughput. Uh, but if you're trying to do this early game, the best thing to do is probably to make a kiln out of something that's not going to melt at that temperature. Set up an oil, uh, set up an auto sweeper in a vacuum with like a conductive panel or something, and use that to feed the kiln like clay. And just have that kiln keep producing ceramic. The heat, the 20 kDTU's of heat from the kiln is probably going to be enough to flip the oil over to petroleum, and you're going to have a room full of like 405. 410 ish degrees of petroleum. Okay, it's fine. But you're max geotuning this, and the end result is instead of getting 125 grams per second of crude oil on average, you're getting 250 grams per second of petroleum on average, which is not a huge amount. So if you're using this for power, yeah, sorry, I've, yeah, let me look at this. If you're using this for power, it's effectively 250 watts of power if you're running it through a petroleum generator. But <laughs> there's many caveats. You're getting a lot of waste products out. You're getting you're getting a lot of carbon dioxide. You're getting some polluted water out, but it's a it's a minuscule amount of polluted water. This is not a viable water source for your colony geotuning a leaky oil fissure, believe it or not. So the, the waste products are more annoying than useful in this case where you're doing this in the early game. And it's it's still too hot to actually use steel for. So you're going to need to cool it down just to run the machines with it. So you're going to need a steam turbine or something to cool this down or to dump water on it, etc. Um, and that's just to get it to the point of where you're using it. Um, if you're using it to make plastic instead, then you're going to have to cool down the petroleum so the plastic doesn't come out as naphtha. Or, or do it, or do it in a, a room where you're actively cooling it a lot to make sure that you're not getting this naphtha. Now, if you want naphtha, that's fine. You can use naphtha for liquid blocks, but you're probably not going to want to make a massive amount of it, and you're probably not going to want to geotune a geyser with a finite resource to get naphtha. There are better ways of getting naphtha. So you're gonna have, you're gonna want to cool it down anyways if you're using it for that. So here's what I would suggest. Instead of geotuning this and getting petroleum and cooling it down with an elaborate setup, just cool down the oil and use an oil refinery early game. You can set up an oil refinery pretty easily early game. You can set up in the same, you can set it up in the natural gas room like I've talked about on YouTube before. Send that natural gas to where your plants are, your, your natural gas generators, and just use the oil well. Yes, you're technically getting less throughput, but you're not wasting the finite resource. Um, and you're not going through all of the extra complexity. The, an early game, the complexity is going to be the obstacle to you doing this. It's just too complex to do, and the end results I just don't think are worth it because you're still going to need geo you're, you're still going to need cooling anyways. The end result is not very good. I just think you're better off just doing it using an oil refinery, and then late game you, geo using that abyss light to geotune a magma volcano to give you so much heat that you can just boil and cool down your petroleum with an actual petroleum boiler. Like, when you've got the resources to make it and use, like, a percentage of the Abyss Light that you would be feeding this thing. This is absolutely a trap. So, do not geotune a leaky oil fissure unless you're doing it for the memes and for the laughs. That That's just my opinion. So that's all the Abyss Light geysers. The next geysers I want to talk about are the Cum Dioxide Vents. And these are somewhat unique in that they actually use polluted dirt as the material that you use to geotune them. And polluted dirt is usually a waste product that you don't actually want. Um, so it's not bad having that as the material that you feed into it. However, 
the actual impact of geotuning a carbon dioxide vent is almost zero. So, first of all, the vents themselves do not produce a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, the liquid carbon dioxide vent will produce, I believe, 150 grams per second on average at a low temperature. That is not a lot of carbon dioxide. If you're feeding slixes off it, that's not a huge amount. And you're going to have to heat that up anyways. Geotuning the carbon dioxide vents does not heat them up significantly. The heat increases only by 5 degrees C. The heat capacity of carbon dioxide is very low. You are not getting significant extra heat doing this. So what you're effectively doing is you're swapping... For both of these carbon dioxide geysers, you're effectively swapping 25 grams per second of polluted dirt for either 30 grams per second of cold carbon dioxide or 21 grams per second of hot carbon dioxide. So the overall throughput of geotuners running this for carbon dioxide vents is very low. If you're feeding slicksters with it, fair enough, but you're going to get a lot more CO2 by geotuning... Um, by, you're going to get a lot more CO2 just from other sources. Just running petroleum generators. Just running other like uh, natural gas generators. You're going to get more carbon dioxide from other sources. So I... I can't really think of any cases where you would really want to even bother doing this. I really don't think it's actually worth the power cost of running the geotuner and getting your duplicate to do the errand over and over again. Because the end result is mostly just that you're feeding the polluted dirt to slicksters and turning it into oil. But if you want to feed your polluted dirt to a critter, you can feed the polluted dirt to poke shells and get sand from the excretions and lime from the poke shells. Or you can feed it to sage hatches to get coal. Those are both easier to set up early on. And early on is probably when you're going to want to dispose of your polluted dirt because you don't want it. If you're on a map that has a very large amount of polluted dirt, you're probably going to want to do that anyway. So you're probably going to want to feed the sage hatches, get that going early on. Or use that polluted dirt for oxygen. But the, the but yeah, like honestly, I think I would rather use a sublimation station to turn that polluted dirt into oxygen and not have to put up with all the errands and all the power from using the geotuners. So, I can see what they were going for with this, but they need to, like, increase the quantities. Like, I, I, I mean, obviously this is consistent, this is 20% of the geyser output, but there's really no point in doing this at the moment. They need to change, they need to change something about this to make it actually worth getting someone to run a geotuner. So I'm just putting these in D, D tier. Your duplicates have better things to do than geotuning these. Like, all of the time. So then, that leaves us with the final three geysers here. So, these geysers are interesting in that they are actually geotuned with salt directly instead of bleach stone. And obviously, nowadays, you can use 30 grams of salt, 30 kilograms of salt, and turn it into 10 kilograms of bleach stone with a bleach stone hopper. So, there is the direct comparison between bleach stone and salt now, when that wasn't the case. Um, so... Let me just rip off the band-aid. You do not want to geotune oxygen or... In fact, um, you don't want to geotune the hot polluted oxygen or the infectious polluted oxygen vents. It's not worth the time. You're essentially using 25 grams per second of salt to get 21 grams per second of oxygen out of those geysers on average. So late game, it's obviously not worth doing. The heat increase of 15 degrees C is minimal. The gas has minimal heat capacity so that's fine but usually the extra heat that you're putting into the water is actually a bonus because you're using that to run steam turbines or to actually boil the water or get and get something out of it easier um whereas you're just getting hot oxygen that you don't really want to be hot and it's not a meaningful amount of heat anyways so i just don't think it's worth doing the only case where i find oxygen vents to actually be relevant is when you have is when you have like a single dupe on an asteroid. They don't have a water source, but they do have an oxygen vent. So they've technically got enough oxygen to survive off of that. But here's the thing. I would literally rather just geotune a water geyser and ship them oxygen via payloads than, than, than geotuning an oxygen vent to get marginally more oxygen. Salt and bleach stone are relatively hard to come by, um, especially if you're not geotuning saltwater geysers or the cool slush geysers um, for it renewably. Um, I just don't think it's worth wasting. It's a lot of complexity as well. If you've got like one duplicate on an asteroid and they're living off of <laughs> sucking an oxygen vent, 
Your duplicate is not going to want to spend a fair amount of their time doing research errands for a Geotuno to, to, to breathe more oxygen. It's, it's just not a good deal. So I've saved the best for last. <laughs> I've saved an interesting guys for last. It's the chlorine gas vent. And this might surprise you. I'm actually going to put this in B tier for geotuning. And there's an interesting reason for that. So you geotune this with salt as well. You geotune it with 25 grams per second of salt, and it turns into 21 grams per second of chlorine. Chlorine does not have a lot of heat capacity. The heat does not increase very much. So the temperature is basically irrelevant, even if you're max geotuning it. But it does let you turn salt into chlorine. And guess what? If you have squeaky puffs in your puff branch, you could turn chlorine gas directly into bleachstone. So this becomes 20 grams per second of bleachstone. You're turning 25 grams per second of salt into 20 grams per second of bleachstone. Whereas if you were doing that in a bleachstone hopper, you would only be getting 8.33 grams per second of bleachstone from the hopper. And it would require power and it would require it would require gold metal as well, which you may not necessarily have. So if you have chlorine vents, I think it absolutely is worth prioritizing geotuning them. I would probably actually put it above the, the steam vent and the cool salt wash guys. I don't know, maybe. Uh, ranching puffs is annoying. I think this is a good spot for it. Um, ranching puffs is annoying, but this is ultimately going to give you more materials for geotuning. Um, geotuning this chlorine gas. It's going to give you more bleach stone than you would if you didn't geotune it. And then that will let you geotune more water sources and it can kind of stack up pretty quickly. Like if you're you if you're geotuning a chlorine vent, feeding that chlorine to squeaky puffs, and then using that bleach stone to geotune a cool salt slush geyser, you're you're getting a lot of bleach stone and a lot of salt out of this combo. Um, so that can give you a lot of those geotuning resources. And if you just want bleach stone for something else, like hand sanitizer or water weeds domestically, it gives you a pretty good amount of access to that. Chlorine is relatively limited as well. The vents do not produce a lot of chlorine um, and not a lot of planets actually have the vents. So if you have a chlorine gas vent, it I think it is worth geotuning this just to get more geotuning resources. Um, the reason I'm not putting it higher than B tier is because it's a, it's a means to an end. You're geotuning this so you can geotune more of the better geysers. But I would probably just prioritize geotuning those geysers first to help get your colony up and running, and then geotuning your chlorine vent and setting up the squeaky puffs so that your supply chain becomes easier once you're more established. Um, similar with geotuning a, a cool salt slush geyser. So yeah, those are my opinions overall on geotuning uh, geysers. We've, we've already geotuned a few of these on stream. We've geotuned the um, we've geotuned the cool steam vent. We are currently geotuning sulfur geysers. We're very soon going to be geotuning metal volcanoes. And we're very soon going to be geotuning a regular magma volcano as well, which I'm excited about on Badlands Boffins. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to exploring this a bit more. These are just my thoughts from a purely mathematical point of view about what's worth geotuning in terms of resources uh, for benefit and like use cases where it might be useful to your colony early, like potentially with the natural gas vent, um, or later on with the with the Niobium volcano being heads and shoulders above all the other geysers. Very tempting, honestly, to put it in an SS tier or an S plus tier. Like it's 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 ridiculous value. If you're not geotuning this, I feel like that's just the complete incorrect decision. Um <laughs> But I haven't gotten to that point yet, so if you have, please let me know in the comments if I'm wrong and this is a massive waste of time. I suspect it isn't. <laughs> um, oh, one more thing I actually forgot to mention about the magma volcanoes is uh, when you're geotuning these, you want to use up to four geotuners. If you use five geotuners on a magma volcano, you are not going to get magma. You are going to get rock gas. And rock gas is a lot less conductive than magma. And it is going to exchange heat very quickly with the solid tiles that you're using to encase the volcano. Even your insulated tiles are going to heat up quickly when subjected to rock gas. So I'm not sure whether the complexity of geotuning a magma volcano with the rock gas is worth the extra 20% throughput and the extra heat. 
Um, I mean, if you want to do a build that uses rock gas, be my guest. I think generally you would probably just prefer to set up a magma, um, like a magma tamer with with just four geotuners and then just handling it normally. But let me know if you've managed to handle rock gas in an efficient way, because uh, I'd really like to see that. And <laughs> we, we joke a lot about it on stream. Yeah, those are all my thoughts on these geysers. So this is, again, this is a geotuning prioritization tier list, not a geyser prioritization tier list. I've already done a video on that and you realistically probably already seen it. Um, my opinions on the geysers in that video haven't really changed too much. The one thing I would say is I think I did the sulfur geyser a little bit dirty. Um, I think it is a bit easier to set up a sulfur geyser than I thought at the time of recording that video and the benefit is well worth it. So I think I would probably move that up a tier. And with the addition of geotuning and bleachstone being relevant, I think the chlorine gas vent has become a lot better than I gave it credit for in that video as well. Um, still fairly niche, because it's not directly helping your colony, but definitely worth looking at more than the other the other lower ranked uh, geysers I put it with. But uh, yes. Uh, so thanks for watching. Let me know uh, in the comments what your thoughts are on geotuning, whether you like it, whether there's things you change about it, what you tend to prioritize geotuning in your colonies. Um, we do stream Oxygen Not Included on Twitch quite regularly. Uh, Mondays and Thursdays at the moment is the plan for 2024. We have a couple of runs going where we're using GeoTuners at the moment. Uh, we do upload all of the VODs to YouTube as well alongside these discussion videos. So if you want to catch up on a series, feel free to have a look here. And there's also the Discord page where we all hang out and post memes and builds. A lot of people have been posting their own tier lists on the Discord recently, which I think is really cool. Um, it's really nice seeing all of your opinions there on it and having those discussions with you. I sometimes talk about this in the Twitch streams as well, and uh, it's really fun. So if you post something interesting in the Discord, odds are I'm probably going to bring it up on the Twitch stream at some point. But uh, yes, thanks for watching. If uh, you do want to contribute to the stream or the channel, you can become a YouTube member or a Twitch subscriber. Um, you will get access to fishy emotes of Whiskers and the other denizens of the fish and frog tanks. And uh, you'll be directly contributing to me improving the stream, getting new equipment, getting new games, um, all that jazz. Um, but yes, thanks for watching, and I'll, I'll let Whiskers see you out. Bye for now. Whiskers sends thanks to the following Twitch subscribers and YouTube members. Carmike0802 DeadeyeXL Grey Area Nemetrek Neo Deus Machina The Max Not Binary Tapki Plus, Treble Queen, and Euglavisk.